So uh, this morning, we are going to um, go through the book of Titus, chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Um, and this morning, we're going to focus on what are the qualifications for elders? What are the qualifications for elders? Uh, if you were not here, um, probably about a month ago, I taught through uh, the first t- teaching of Titus, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And I want to kind of give you a brief um, cliff notes of that. So uh, bear with me here. The, the first, one, some of the things we talked about were the following. Um, Paul's urgency in this letter regarding the importance of sound doctrine within the, ter- in the church, uh, being able to preach and teach soundly. Uh, the next thing we talked about uh, was the crazy Cretan culture that existed um, and, and even so that it resembled the culture that we currently live in today. And I'll briefly talk about that a little bit more moving forward. We also talked about how false teachers, um, which were known as Judaizers, began to creep into the church in Crete, many of these home churches. Um, And what they were beginning to proclaim was they were proclaiming that salvation came through circumcision. It came through the Mosaic law. And they were not proclaiming that it came through Christ and Christ alone. And then lastly, um, the urgent necessity, Paul makes mention the urgent necessity to set right what remained, to set right what remained. And so this morning, we're going to go through verses five through nine. Again, Titus chapter one, verses five through nine. I'm going to read it um, together. And I pray that you read it with me. I mean, these are the words of Paul. He says this, for this reason, I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance to the teaching so that we will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, your word that we stand on, your word that is our anchor, your word that does not fail. God, I pray that this morning we will understand the need and the necessity for sound leadership in our elders. We'll understand the importance of elder-led churches, Father God, and why you left that for the New Testament church. God, I now pray that the prayers of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God, I pray that you speak through me. Use my words, Father God, as you must. God, I pray that above all things, that we will be effectual doers of your word and not simply hearers that delude themselves. For it is in the doing of the word that we are blessed. Strengthen us now by your grace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Dr. Dan Allender wrote a book entitled Leading Character. And in his book, Leading Character, he writes these profound words, and I quote, The actual word in the Greek, character, originally was used in connection with tools designed for engraving. And character is indeed a tool that marks us, that in one sense it cuts us, it shapes us, and it engraves us. We are image bearers who are intended by God to make him known in a fashion that no one else on the earth can do in the same way. You know, character is everything. You can earn a job or you can lose a job based upon the character of an individual. The true character of a person can attempt to be hidden, but what comes out through pressure with time will be revealed. One thing, family, that you cannot fake is character. You see, it reveals the systems and the beliefs by which one lives. Ultimately, your beliefs will be revealed in your behaviors. And this morning, we will see how the qualifications of elders 
church structure and the structure even of marriage and family life are intertwined in selecting elders. And we're going to see the following things. And if you're taking notes, just follow me here. Um, You're going to see that God's structure of the family is essential to the body of Christ and the thriving of the family. You're going to see leadership in the church must be carefully considered. The next thing you're going to see is positions and roles do not make the man of God, but rather it is God himself that makes the man. Leadership is to be patterned after the great shepherd, which is Jesus Christ. And lastly, Christ is the head of the church, and we should look to him for all things. Again, to briefly recap from the last teaching I did in Titus, Titus is giving this instruction by Paul. He's given this instruction to do the following, and I love it. He says, Titus, you must set in order what remains. Set in order what remains. And Paul gives specific instructions on how to accomplish this. He tells Titus, Titus, you are to appoint elders in every church. As I mentioned before, the reasoning behind the need for organization in the Cretan church was because the Cretans were a chaotic culture. Cretans is known by their own prophet Epimenides was said to be always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons, according to Titus chapter 1, verse 12. You see, the task that Titus is given by Paul is not an easy task. One could assume based upon the size of Crete, which was approximately 35,000 miles wide, that he would need to appoint elders in every single city. Now, as I mentioned this, you, you might be asking yourself, how could one man know who to appoint as an elder within these home churches? And as we walk throughout the text, we're going to see that the qualifications for these elders required much more than casual awareness and simple pleasantries of familiarity. This letter will outline for Titus as well as the church today what the qualifications of the appointment of an elder was and is. But however, before we jump to the qualifications of an elder, I would like to establish a definition for what an elder is. Uh, The word elder comes from the Greek word presbyteros. Uh, It means an older man, a wise man, a community leader that assists in making leadership decisions for the church. This appointment, friends, is not to be taken lightly. It is to be diligently prayed about, observed by recommendation, but most of all, entrusted by God. Acts chapter 14, verse 23 It describes the appointment of elders in this way. This is the writing of Luke. He says this, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended to the Lord in whom they had believed. And as you can see, the appointment of elders was not unknown to the New Testament saints. Not only was it common for the New Testament churches, but it required much diligent an observation of that eligible prospect. And as we dive further into Titus, it is my prayer that you and I will be able to see the significance, the importance of an elder-led church. Most importantly, how these elders will guard against false teaching, serve as guardians of the body and protectors of the flock, So let's dive into the text. Pick me up in verse 5 of Titus chapter 1. And these are the words of Paul to Titus. He says this, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Titus was charged with the responsibility to, here it is, set in order what remained and to appoint elders in every city. The what that remains specifically deals with the existing Christian churches there in Crete. Now, these churches, they heard the gospel message. They heard the proclamation of Jesus Christ, but they were lacking something. They were lacking organization. And with anything new that has been established, there is a need to maintain the foundation and the function of it. 
So when I, when I think of a healthy organization, uh, one that comes to mind is, is my favorite, and you probably know this, restaurant Chick-fil-A, or as my children will call it, Chicken Filet. Um, and, and, and what's interesting about Chick-fil-A as an organization is that it is always consistent with its customer service. I mean, I've never gone to a Chick-fil-A where I've seen anyone grumpy or unattentive, um, either waiter or waitress. And the reason their service is so consistent is because their service, here it is, is set in order. Because the franchise is following Chick-fil-A headquarters. The expectations are the same. The customer service is the same. And the messaging throughout every Chick-fil-A is the same. And in this same way, Paul is looking for Titus to establish these elders as a means to both set the example of right living and sound teaching. We mentioned this word set in order. And in the Greek, that word is epidetho. It literally means to set right to set right. And and that word was used by medical writers regarding setting broken limbs in place or rather straightening crooked ones out. And I'm sure for those of you who experienced maybe a broken bone or bones, it's a painful experience. You see, the tools that are used to make this adjustment to set in order are to set in place to provide these guardrails, these these parameters by which healthy growth can begin to occur. You see, the text makes clear that the means by which these things are to be set in order is to be done through the actions and the role of the elders in the church. Elders provide these, these guardrails, these protection barriers for the body to grow properly as these elders submit themselves under the lordship of Christ by way of the scriptures. Now, the only question that arises from the text at this point is how will Titus accomplish this challenging task? More specifically, you, you might want to know what was the number of churches that were present on the island of Crete that Titus would have to frequent. One scholar documented that Homer, who lived in the ninth century, referred to the island of Crete in a hyperbolic way, and he said this, Crete of the hundred cities. This apostolic responsibility was given to Titus by Paul to accomplish the work that had to be completed. This assignment Paul gave Titus required that Titus travel throughout all of Crete to identify these men within the church as elders or overseers. Here it, elders, plural, more than one, to look over these churches. Paul in verse 6 would then give these qualifications for the men that would be selected. So follow me, verse 6, Paul says this. Namely, if any man is beyond reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of indecent behavior or rebellion. Paul outlines a description and function of who an elder is and how that elder should behave. Did you see it? That that Paul mentions that the elders have a societal and a domestic expectation. They have a societal and a domestic expectation. Uh, most, Most evident in the text is Paul's qualification for public and private purview regarding leadership within the church. While at the same time, he's interweaving this structure of marriage and family life as a qualifier. He mentions that the elder must be a man, here it is, above reproach. The word above reproach in the Greek is anikletos, literally means without reproach or blameless. If I were to break it down in a statement, I would say this. The the man's life was to be observed and inspected so much so that it bears witness to his life's consistency with what he believed. However, this is an expectation for both these men in public and in private according to their relationship with Jesus Christ. 
1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 through 3 says this, An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, skillful in teaching, not overindulging in wine, not a bully, but gentle, not contentious, free from the love of money. The fact that Paul begins with an elder needing to be above reproach is first indicating the frame of lens by which everything else is to follow. If if I were to put it plainly, family, the leadership of this man must be clearly evident even if no one is looking. Your uprightness is not something that can simply be turned on and turned off like a light switch. The the text allows us to see that any leader in leadership, whether in public or in private, at home or elsewhere, requires authenticity. Paul jumps out the gate with the standard that this man is to be married. A one woman man. I want to be specific because within the context, you have to understand that Cretans were crazy folk. Okay. The the, the men literally made the assumption that they could sleep with any other man's wife that they wanted to. There was no respect for marriage in that day in that regard. So this is why Paul makes clear. Listen, one wife. Shouldn't surprise you. When being considered for the role in the elder, the apostle compares the responsibility to that of a husband and his family. Remember that the text is making extremely clear that these elders are to be men that are countercultural. These men are to be held in a higher standard and their lives are to reflect that of the one in whom called them and saved them. And that is Jesus Christ alone. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17 says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things pass away. Behold, new things have come. Something that may strike you as odd in reading verse six, Paul mentions that these elders should have children who are believing. Now, why would the scriptures have this particular qualifier for an elder? I, I can see that on one hand, being able to raise children to be faithful and trustworthy and obedient demonstrates proper training and proper control under the care of that father. I mean, raising children in a crazy, chaotic culture is a parental responsibility upon that family. And on the other hand, the scripture mentions that these elders' children are to be believing. They are to be believing. So so does this mean that all the elders' children are to be believers in Jesus Christ? Now, friends, truly, this would be a remarkable thing. That the children who are underneath this elder are believing children who've put their trust and their hope and their faith in Jesus Christ. However, put a pin in it, salvation does not come through men. Salvation comes through Christ alone, by faith alone, through grace alone. So we first must recognize here that if we do not understand the original language, the scriptures can be misinterpreted. So I want to help us out this morning. The word for believe in this case, in the Greek, that word for believe is pistos, P-I-S-T-O-S. It is not to be confused with pestis, P-I-S-T-I-S. Pestos means to be proven to be firm, reliable, trustworthy. That's according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. And that confirms this particular position. However, Pestis, P-I-S-T-I-S, is always a gift from God. And it is not something that can be produced by human beings. Pestis, my friends, is by divine persuasion. That you and I come to faith in Christ alone. 
That father cannot try to save their child because the salvation is not handed or resting in the hands of that father. It is resting in the hands of our heavenly father. So what is Paul saying here? The way in which a man raises his children and is faithful to his wife is indicative of his home management as well as his parental, his parental, marital, and familial relationship is a window view to which his ability to steward the church is seen. This is witnessed not just at home. This is also witnessed in the public sphere. And Paul wraps up verse 6 by saying that these men are not to be accused of dissipation or rebellion. In other words, these men should not drink excessively to the point that they become drunk. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 says, And do not get drunk with wine in which there is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. These men's influence is based upon God's Spirit and not by secular satisfaction. Now, does it mean that this man can't have a, a glass of wine? No. As long as he is not compelled to the point that he's drinking, that he loses his mind, He's not worthy for that position. Do you follow me, church? Not only should they not be accused of dissipation or drunkness, but they should not be accused of rebellion, of rebellion. Titus chapter one, verse 10 states this. For there are many rebellious people, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. These are the men who Titus was told to get rid of out of the church. For many of these home churches began to have these Judaizers, these false leaders creep into the church so much so that they begin to find leadership positions. Men who are proclaiming that Christ, that, that, that salvation comes through circumcision and not Christ. These were the men that were beginning to lead these churches. So you can imagine as, as Titus is reading this letter from Paul, as they're gathering all of these congregants together, that these false teachers are beginning to creep back because they're beginning to be put on notice that we shouldn't be here, that we're teaching the wrong thing. Can I find the nearest exit? Paul's urgency in this letter places huge emphasis on the protection of the body of Christ just as a father protects his own family. Friends, Titus's assignment was to find fitting fatherly men, but above all godly men who would guard and shepherd and protect the flock. And clearly these men that Titus would come to find would stick out like sore thumbs because it's eliminating, eliminating all of the rest of the men that were known during that time. The character of these men would be easily blameless and unaccused because their lives were reflective of what they believed. They should be marked by sound teaching and not enticed to believe in false teaching. Why? Because they know what sound doctrine looks like. They're living it. They're reading the word. And as a simple application for us as a church, you and I here at VBVF, you can rest assured that whoever God sends our way as the new senior pastor of this church, that the elders are guarding the gate. They are making sure that any man that steps into this pulpit will be a man that is sound in their teaching. They're not going to cause you to toss to and fro. Why? Because the foundation of Pastor Stephen Armstrong was set here on what sound teaching looks like so that those who hear it, those who hear it, those who hear it will know what you should expect. Moving on to verse 7, Paul says, For the overseer must be above, beyond reproach, as God's steward, not self willed, not quick tempered, not overindulged in wine, not a bully, not greedy for money. Paul outlines what we will call this morning the five must nots. Five must nots, and they are the following Don't be arrogant. Don't be quick tempered. Don't be a drunkard. Don't be violent. Don't be greedy for gain. Or in some of your translations, it may say love of money. That if these 
men were to be godly stewards of the church, their personal stewardship had to be well taken care of. These qualifications are evident of the fact that God is to make these men by his spirit, not these men making themselves available for a position. Let's dive into the first must not. The first must not is the elder must not be arrogant. Must not be arrogant. Simply put that this elder is not a prideful man. It's not about him. Doesn't surround around what he wants, what he wants it to look like. But rather, what does Christ want? What does Christ want the church to look like? Peter spoke of these types of self-indulging men in, in this particular way. He says this in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10, and especially those who are indulged in the flesh and its corrupt passion and despise authority, reckless, self-centered, they speak abusively of angelic majesties without trembling. Elders must be men that are marked by humility. I'm going to say that again. Elders are men that are marked by humility. Next, uh, the elder must not be quick-tempered, must not be quick-tempered. Uh, this man is not easily taken to violence or anger. In other words, this man demonstrates to the utmost patience, patience. Uh, the, the reason quick-tempered men are not suitable for being an elder is responding quickly in frustration will result in foolishness which is unwise. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 17 says at best, a quick-tempered person acts foolishly. And a person of evil devices is hated. Thirdly, elders are not to be drunkards. And in some of your translations, it may say addicted to wine. The bottle is not where this man chooses to drink for his nutrition, for his satisfaction, for his substance. Rather, in other words, the Bible is his guidance, not the bottle. Does that make sense? The, the Bible is his guiding force, not the bottle. It is the Bible that leads this man to proper behavior. This particular must not is interesting. Uh, because as I was doing my research, I found that within Crete during this particular time, that there would oftentimes be drunken worship. And this would come through a Greek god known by the name of Dionysus, who was known for wine and ecstatic experience. He became a cult in the Roman civilization. Um, and quickly, the Roman Empire was trying to address this drunken worship acts. This cult was marked by drunken behavior coupled with orgies and violent outbursts. These were a grave need. There was a grave need for these elders to be men who were wholeheartedly Christ-centered and not of the culture. Fourthly, the elder is not to be a violent man. And the word here in the Greek literally means a striker or a brawler. This person uh, I'm talking, this person is ready to go at any moment, at any given time. If somebody steps on their shoe, they're going to punch them in the face. And, and what, the, what the text is letting us know is that this man must not exhibit that type of behavior. Now, wh why would that be the case, friends? Well, when it comes down to ministry, ministry deals with people. And with people comes what? Problems. So within a large body, with all kinds of problems from different areas of life, these elders, these men have to deal with these issues. And if that individual spikes up because they're frustrated, the elder must exercise patience. You said to, you, somebody might have said something to somebody and the elder's not going to respond out of frustration. They just sit back and wait in patience. Surely the elder will come across that. And, and even, um, even more, uh, just to bring it to the text, Jesus deals with this situation with Peter. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 51 through 52, it says this, and behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached out and drew his sword 
and struck the slave on the high priest and cut off his ears. Man, Peter, Peter, Peter. Uh, then, then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in it to its place for all those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. There's a different way of living for people of God who are people that are marked by a life in Christ. Lastly, the elder must not be a lover of money. Motivation for this man was not money or influence or power or control, but rather Christ being proclaimed in the hearts and the lives of the men and women that would come under their leadership to see Christ be glorified through their life in their living. First Timothy chapter six, verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Friends, if an elder possesses these must nots, Paul makes it clear that not only is it bad for that person, it's bad for the body. That the position, hear me when I say this, the position will not humble you. If you're a man that struggles with these particular must not, you, 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 you might not want to strive to aspire to this role. Why? Because all it's going to do is amplify what's in you. So if you're angry and you come up against a situation in church and you're ready to square up with somebody, that's an indication that you might want to pump the brakes. The position doesn't make you. Christ makes you by his spirit. Verse eight, let's keep going. Uh, but, but here we go. But, but be hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled. Right after Paul lays out the must-nots, he then contrasts it with the must-haves. And, and here are the six must-haves. And, and as I go through it, some of your translations may read a bit differently. Here it goes. Be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Hospitable is our first must have. It literally means loving strangers. Loving strangers. No matter where you've come from, no matter your background, no matter what you've done, you're welcome, friend. Come on, we're all broken and jacked up. Come on. Come on, you're welcome. This person displays a welcoming, hospitable spirit. Next is lover of good. That these men are to love what is right, to love what is godly, to love what is true. And, and all of that is predicated upon the scriptures. That, that, that this is a matter of what is good in not the sight of men, but in the sight of God. There's another definition in the Greek that it simply says this, and I love it best, loving what is good. Loving what is good. Paul then mentions the next one, self-controlled. And some of your translations may read sensible. This means that the elder is sober-minded. This elder is sound in mind. That they are in the sane state. Why are they in a sane state? Well, because their guiding decisions and mechanisms for decision-making is simply predicated upon the Spirit leading them and guiding them in and through life. The Spirit is their guide. Are they perfect? No. Romans 3 tells us that there's no perfect person. No, not one. The only perfect person is Christ. So when you hear the must nots and you hear the must haves, understand that all of this is able to be accomplished because that person, that man is under the leadership of Christ. Next one is upright. The elder must be upright. The elder is to be righteous in all things. And if things are done out of order, and I love it, they're going to make it their business to make it right. Not right in the sense of what they think is right. Because what you may think is right may be different than from what I think is right. 
But when this book is the guide by which we live, we all know what's right. And we stick with this. The next must have is the elder must be holy. Must be holy. And when you think of holy, recognize that this holiness is not found in you. It's not found in me. It's not found in anyone in this earth. That this holiness comes from what God has freely given us in the person of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. First Peter chapter one, verse 14 through 16 says it this way regarding holiness. As an obedient child, do not be conformed to the form of lust which you were in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who has called you, here it is, be holy yourselves also in all your, check it out, behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Paul concludes the six must nots with the final qualification, discipline. Y'all, I was racking my brain on this one. Why didn't Paul put that as the first one? Why did Paul use discipline as the last qualifier for the elders qualification? Why, why did he do that? And this is what I surmise. This is what I believe that discipline is the means by which these other qualities are exercised consistently to produce godliness and growth in grace. I, I can't say that I'm a hospitable person, but then the next day, surely, is that person coming over today? Yeah, honey, he's coming over. Golly, I just... I just can't, you know, you have to be hospital. And where does that come from? Because the reality is, guess what? There are going to be days that you don't want to be hospitable. There are going to be days that you don't want to be loving. Why? I'm dealing with people. But here's the beauty of it. If Christ is glorified in my life and I'm submitted under his authority and his spirit is leading me, guess what? By his grace, come on in, come on in. I love you. Come on in, press on in. Second Peter chapter one, verse five through eight says this. Now for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence, knowledge and in your knowledge, self-control and in your self-control, perseverance and in your perseverance, godliness and in your godliness, brotherly kindness and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if all these qualities are yours and are increasing, they do not make you useless nor unproductive in the true knowledge of who our Lord is. Jesus Christ. Friends, there is a benefit to these qualities. And recognize, please, please, please recognize that these qualities are not just for elders. They're for you and me. That the elders aren't just holding, and this is just a short list. I mean, this is, this is not, this is not a, a extensive. This is a small piece. Wait, what does this mean for us? This means that every single believer that occupies a space in the house of God must abide by these things. It's not just, oh, that's the elder thing. Oh, the elders have to be, the elders have to love. No, 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 no. You have to love too. You have to be kind too. You have to be hospitable too. Why? Because because Christ was, did the same for you and the same for me. He died on the cross so that you and I might be the righteousness of God. Yes. How much so should you and I do the same? Before we begin to ask these questions, why should this matter? These characters are marked by believing people. That the life of the believer should stand out from amongst the culture. And every single believer should reflect Christ in every area of our lives. Paul's going to bring us to this culminating point in verse 9. He says this. And I'm going to try not to preach this happy. 
holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict it. We see that the quality of this man is marked by his life in light of the scriptures. His life should both be encouraging to others and it should convict others to the point of correction. That this man is able to do this because of the power of the spirit of God in his own life, because of his obedience and his submission to Christ and his word. The text says, holding fast the faithful word in accordance with the teaching. Y'all, obviously this man and these men are so faithful to the text that when they hear something that is off, if they hear something that is taught improperly, it triggers something in their mind. Your familiarity with sound teaching should be so keen that the moment you hear something is off, a red flag should go off. What did he say? He said, what? No, 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 no. Walk with me. Talk, let, let's go through the Bible together. Let, let, let's talk it out. That, that, that if you want to see God's transformative power at work in your life, Be a doer of the word and watch transformation take place in your life. What did Pastor Steve always tell us? If you teach the Bible, good things are going to happen. Why, friends, do good things happen? Because when you teach the text, transformation happens. You get away from the text and you begin to see an unproductive life. Now, the question that you might be asking yourself is regarding holding fast, how? How how do I hold fast to what I'm hearing to make sure that it is true? What do I measure that by? You will see the fruit of your faithfulness in following Christ. The truth that you are holding on to this very word of God, it will produce transformation in your life. I bet my book on it. I'll put all my 401k on that. Okay. (laughs) On the fact that this word is not going to fail you. Scripture tells us the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. So if that is the case, that if I live this word out, tried and true, that the power of the spirit of God is going to work in my life so much so that I ain't going to look the same. I ain't going to do the same stuff I used to do. I ain't going to talk to the same folks I used to talk to. They used to get me in trouble. Why? Because God has got a hold of my life. Paul then mentions in the text that this elder, these elders will be able to exhort and sound doctrine, and to refute those who contradict it. This believer who is selected as elders should be able to encourage men to stand faithful to the text. And because of the care of these elders, they are diligently disciplined in seeing the growth of every member under their care. It's this fatherly affection that these elders have in being committed to seeing that every person who's here at VBVF, even in those churches that were in Crete, that every person comes to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Exhorting in sound doctrine is then followed by refute individuals who contradict sound doctrine and teaching. Now the word Refute in the Greek means to expose. Expose. And the goal in refuting, and please hear me, because oftentimes I've seen this more times than not in many churches around the world, 
is that when people are refuted, this can either cause people to just want to be done and they leave and they walk away and they never want to come back to the church. So hear me when I say this. The goal in refuting this individual is not to lose them. It's not to cause them to lose, but rather to convince them of the truth. This love for the body is similar to the love of that of Christ himself. If I love you enough, I'm going to pull you aside and show you what is right and show you where you're wrong. And in the same breath, I'll tell you where I've been wrong and bring you back to the text to tell you what grounds me. But woe unto us when we become a church that cannot refute each other in a loving way back to the text. And then people start leaving the church because, oh man, that church was so mean to me and they said this and they said that. No, 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 I came to you in love. Just just as a father disciplines his child. Yeah, that child's going to be angry. Yeah, that child may be upset. Yeah, that child may be a little frustrated. But guess what? After he comes back out of that punishment, I, I know you hurt, but I love you. I know I took away that Xbox, but I love you. I'm doing this. Why? Because there's some things that you have to learn that when if I were to just let you go, you wouldn't learn it. See, discipline requires that if I love you, I'm doing this because I love you. I don't discipline you because I don't like you. I discipline you because I love you. And in the same way, Paul tells Titus that these elders are to do the same thing, that they're going to build you up in the faith and they're going to build you up in the scriptures. And when they see you slipping, hey, come here. Let's talk. Revelation chapter three, verse 19 says this, those whom, this is Jesus speaking. So hear this clearly. Those whom I love, I reprove. And I discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. The objective behind rebuke is repentance. That if I did something wrong, if I heard the gospel in a wrong way from some other person, some other church, some other teaching, that this elder, these elders come alongside me, these men of God come alongside me, and they take me under their wing, and they show me the truth of the word of God, and then this allows me to see my foolishness, to see myself where I was wrong, and now I can turn away from what I used to do, and now I can live to the glory of Christ. Why? Because I've been shown, I've been convinced by the what? The truth. Paul makes this very clear in Galatians chapter 2 verse 14 where he says this, check it out. When I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, Live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews. How is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? The only way that proper rebuke can occur is if a proper gospel is known, taught, lived, and obeyed. That is the only way, friends. That your life, hallelujah, is a receipt for others to know the life that is now indwelt in you. That Christ who lives in you and dwells richly in you is transforming you. And how do I know that the receipt is my life? Will I be perfect? No. Will I make mistakes? Yes. But guess what's the guiding force? The text. Guess what is the guiding force in the organization? The elders. John MacArthur's book, Reckless Faith, he said these words re, re, uh, regarding counterfeits. He said this, federal agents don't learn to spot counterfeit money by studying the counterfeits. They study genuine bills until they master the look of the real thing. Then when they see the bogus money, they recognize it. True belief in the gospel will always be accompanied by good deeds and right actions. 
As followers of Jesus, you and I should be proven tried and true because the gospel is our anchor. This isn't behavioral modification where you see me one day and you see me the next. I'm a completely different person. No, no, no. That means every day I'm growing from one level of glory to the next level of glory to the next level of glory. Why? Because it's not in Wesley's own strength. It's in the strength of the spirit of God who is within me that as I submit under the leadership of Christ, I submit under the leadership of my church, I submit under under the leadership of the scriptures, sola scriptura, that those things move me. They move me. I pray that we see now more than ever, the elders are a necessity for the church in order to protect the body. It is not a position of prestige. It is a position of humility. It is a pr- position of service. Why are they serving? Because they can look to Christ, who was the great shepherd, who served to the point of death. And as they look to Christ, they begin to look at the scriptures and they say, Lord, lead me. Lord, lead our church. I know we're hurting. I know we lost Pastor Steve. We need you now more than ever. So God, lead us. Help us to be wise in our decision making. Help us to do the right thing, to love the right way. People may be mad with how how short or how fast things are moving, but God be glorified because at the end of the day, through patience, we will see God glorified. I want to pray this morning as a congregation for these men. So if I can have our elders, if you are present in the room, if you can come up to the front, all of our elders and church family, as they are guarding us, It is our responsibility to help in guarding them. Eldership is not a matter of hierarchy. It's a matter of service. So I want to encourage each of us right now to stand up all over the building. And and I'm going to start off in prayer. And I would like you to pray too. The Bible tells us when two or three are gathered in his name, he is there in the midst. There is power in prayer when there's more than one person. So as I pray, in your own words, I want you to be praying with me. So that as we pray for these men to make these decisions that are necessary to help our church move forward. That they are led by the spirit of God to do the work of God, to the glory of God, not unto themselves. They don't do this for themselves. There are countless meetings that you guys don't even know about that I'm not even privy to, that they are in tears trying to figure out what God are you doing in this church? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the men that you've given us in this church who like good fathers are patterned off of the heavenly father to be able to help in guiding and shaping us and helping to teach father God and helping to lead us father God and helping our programs to be all that you're calling them to be father God, not to us. O oh Lord, not to us. O oh Lord, but to your great name for your love and your kindness and your truth. God, we call upon you now, as long as we have breath that you be with these men, that you allow your spirit to guide these men, that you allow your spirit to be with them, to instruct them in wisdom and in doing father God, that as we live our lives to the glory of you, God, that we can look at these men and say, these are men of faith. These are men of the word of God. Father God, and I pray that the men in our church will be able to gather around these men to know what does it look like to be godly men in the homes, Father. That if we can be godly men in the homes and godly men in the community and godly men in the church, God, we can begin to be the light that you've called us to be in this dying world, Father. That when people who are asking, what must I do to be saved, God, they can look at these men, they can look at this church, and God, they can get to say, God, whatever they have, I want. Help us, God, to be men of faith, women of faith, because these qualifications aren't just about them. It's about the body. 
that when, God, you come back and you break open the clouds, that you will receive a church that is blemishless and spotless. We thank you, God. We give you glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Listen, we need each other. This church isn't going anywhere. If you thought after Pastor Steve had passed that this was just going to fall to the wayside, think again. Because the Spirit of God is active in this place. I want to pray for us and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your love, and your grace. We thank you, Father God, for your word that governs us, that guides us, that keeps us, that corrects us when we need correction. Father God, I pray over every person in this room, Lord, that as they leave this place, Father God, that they are encouraged by your word, Father God, to be doers of the word of God and not simply hearers that delude themselves. For it is in the doing of the word that we are blessed. God, strengthen us by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.